G'day fools, I'm Scott Phillips and welcome to yet another in our expanding and ever popular series of Motley Fool Stocks of the Week. This is the series where we bring you a buy recommendation from one of our services. Now, you know the drill by now, but I'm going to do it for new listeners, new viewers, to make sure you understand exactly what you're getting at Motley Fool Stock of the Week. Let's do it. Three things I tell you every week. The first is this is a current buy recommendation at the time of recording. We hope it won't change anytime soon, but we won't guarantee it. So if you're watching this weeks, months, or years into the future, just be mindful of that. It may not still be a current recommendation. Second thing, this is personal, a general advice, not personal advice. Uh, please make sure you understand the fact that it may not be appropriate for your circumstances. Go and see a financial advisor if you need to. And thirdly, that we are long-term investors. This is not a prediction over the next day, week, month, or even year. We are looking out multiple years to investments that are going to be long-term market beaters because that's where the value is. The value of compounding is in the last fraction, the last proportion of your investment horizon. That's often where all the money or most of the money is made. So we're looking for the long term. We're not doing short term predictions. We have no idea where the share price is going next, but we believe over the long term that our buy recommendations in general and our stocks of the week in general, and on average, will be market beaters. That's certainly been our experience thus far and what we're hoping to keep doing for you over the long term. All right, that's out of the way. Drum roll, please. Yep. The analyst we're bringing you today is Andrew Leggett. G'day, Andrew. How are you, mate? Hey, Scott. Doing pretty well. Good man. Good man. Hey, yeah, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different this time. Not, not in terms of the format, but in terms of what we're bringing our listeners and viewers. I think this is the first time we've talked about an ETF. Now, oils ain't oils and ETFs ain't ETFs, at least not anymore. There was a time when ETFs were all about the broad market indexes, the, the ASX 300s or the S&P 500s. These days, an ETF can be pretty much anything. And apparently in the US, there's actually more ETFs than stocks. So popular are these things these days. And this is one of those, right? It's not your low cost index fund. This is a very specific ETF. It is the eSports ETF. Now, uh, mate, you're a bit younger, a bit cooler than me. So you've got more experience with eSports. I'm looking forward to hearing about this one. Let's start with what eSports, not the company, but the security is, and maybe start with exactly what eSports is and what the ETF's made up of. Okay, so the full name, and it's quite a mouthful for this particular <laughs> security we're talking about, is the Van Eck Vectors Video Gaming and Esports ETF. So dear, oh dear. that's a big kind of name to remember. Like the better. ASX code, <laughs> the ASX code is ESPO. That's a lot easier to remember. So nice. what this does is it gives investors exposure to a diversified portfolio of the largest and most liquid companies in the video game market. We're talking developers, okay. hardware create, hardware manufacturers, software providers, uh, and other companies that are in that video gaming esport world. And it seems really kind of silly when you first think about it. Video games, it's just something that we do to pass the time. <laughs> but it's actually a fascinating area to dig into. And I'll just start by saying saying this, the video game industry is huge. It is larger than the music and movie industry combined. That is how, that's how big this market is. And it makes sense when you start thinking every, like there's around two to 3 billion smartphones in the world that you yeah. can play mobile games on, add in all your Sony PlayStation, Xbox consoles, and the odd Atari playing around sitting around for the people that want to stay retro you know and it, I, I, it nice. I, to... I remember it the first time around mate don't about retro i i, I lived hey. that the first time <laughs> it's, it, it's a classic and it's a classic for good reason <laughs> exactly but, i'll take it yeah so it's it's a huge market and it's been growing pretty well too i think in 2020 it grew over 20 percent a year and it's been doing those kind of numbers for a while and i think mm. and what we'll get into is i actually think there's still a long pathway for this industry to go, but mm. we'll move back a little bit. And okay, so we talk. Everyone knows what a video game is. Just the games you play at home. Frogger, Pac-Man. Yeah, that sort of stuff. Yeah, Frog, Frogger, <laughs> Pac-Man, Fortnite, Grand Theft Auto for the for. Oh, now you're now you're know, getting out of my league. The, the kids yeah, today, yeah. or Valorant, <laughs> if you want to get really into it. Um, yeah, so. But esports might be something that is off the radar to many people. Yeah. And so I'll touch on that a bit. So esports is competitive gaming. Mm -hmm. And 
it is a big business in itself. So ones that I'll bring out is, so the 2019 League of Legends World Championship. So League of Legends is a video game, a very popular mm -hmm. one created by Riot Games. In 2019, the World Championship had a combined viewership, people who tuned in to watch that, of over 100 million people. That is more people wow. than watch the Super Bowl in the US. So, mm. and I could go on to, I, I checked in preparation for this video today to go on Twitch, which is the popular video mm. game streaming channel where they do broadcast esports, but also just individuals playing games. And that's a bit of a, a market in itself where people can earn a living by playing video games, which sounds great. And I wish I knew that, you know, 10 odd <laughs> years ago. Uh, you know, and there was over at that very point in time, just a random point in time, there was over 1.5 million people tuned in to watch the top 10 video games. You know, the combined, all the streamers that were, you know, playing the top 10 video games on Twitch, that had a combined audience of 1.5 million people. Right. Now, and, and that's just regular figures. So the esports right. market is big, it's growing, and it's especially big in Asia. And that's where a mm -hmm. lot of these, uh, you know, they will book out stadiums like mm -hmm. the Olympic stadiums and, you know, the biggest arenas, and they will pack that with people who essentially come to watch a screen of people mm -hmm. playing video games and they get really into it. And yeah. now moving back to video games in general, uh, I mentioned streamers, uh, you know, they're becoming more into the mainstream. There's a, a famous streamer called Ninja. Uh, who was playing Fortnite and he signed endorsement deals with Adidas and Red Bull and all these companies and was even on the cover of Sports Illustrated. And wow. you look at these video games too, they're becoming increasingly big platforms, especially during COVID. We had very popular live concerts on Fortnite yeah. and Roblox that had audience mm. in the millions. You know, you can't do that in real life. You can't pack a million people into a stadium to watch a you know a rapper perform live and something that also a lot of people may not know pizza hut has even signed up as a naming rights sponsor to a virtual stadium in so wow. if you play the electronics arts titles madden nfl 20 there is a stadium in there that is sponsored by pizza hut <laughs> and that's because video games are incredibly powerful tools for engagement people will sit there and play for hours and because of that, if you get your brand involved, brand in front of them for hours, then you're probably going to get a better payoff than if you just run a random ad on TV that people might not be actively paying attention to. All right, so, so you're moving the... into the you're moving into the why. Let me let me take you back up a step before we get into more of the uh, why you like it. Uh, so this is an ETF. It's an actively managed ETF, is my understanding, where Vanek are choosing a range of video game makers, esports games slash network slash streaming services, putting them together in some sort of structure uh, based on some sort of analysis and, and methodology, and then making that available to people like you and I on the ASX. Is that a pretty good summary? Yeah. So I've talked about what the industry is and mm -hmm. you know, some of the, some of the, some of the kind of, I guess the bull case, the, the, the yep, tail like that are pushing it forward. Now we'll get into what the ETF actually is. So the ETF has 26 companies in there and you're right. It is an actively managed ETF. Okay. The companies that you're getting in there, you're going to have chip manufacturers like NVIDIA and advanced micro devices. Okay. You're going to have developers like Activision, Electronic Arts and Take-Two Interactive. You've got these big gaming businesses, big diversified gaming businesses like Tencent and Nintendo. And you've got others like, you know, Unity Software, whose gaming engine is pretty much used by the vast majority of mobile games that people play today. Right. So it's a it's diversified. It gives you, mm -hmm. you know, a bit of everything that's kind of important in the video game industry. Um, so you're nice. not just getting developers, you're getting the hardware, you're getting the software, the people who make the games, distribution, all of that stuff in one place. Mm -hmm. But like I said, it does only have 26 names, so it's not the most mm. diversified. Well, <laughs> by the fact it's focused on a single sector, it can't be diversified. Yeah. By definition, but, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and the top 10 companies 
do account for around 60% of the portfolio weighting. Okay. So, but broadly, you're getting a diversified investment in video games and esports managed by someone who in theory knows what they're doing. You're making a, a bet on the sector as a whole because even the best manager in the world can't help you if the sector crashes. So you're, you're betting on the sector to some degree and the growth of that. You're betting on the manager's ability to hopefully select the right companies in the right proportions, and then buying and selling those at the times when they re represent the best value. Is that, is that kind of a, a reasonable summary of what the ETF represents? Yeah, so I mean, it, it's largely market cap driven. So you're getting the big ones right, you, okay. rather okay. than the, a, a portfolio manager kind of picking, okay, well, I think this one is going to win and this one's going to not win. It is based, you know, they're the biggest and most liquid. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but it is nice. a bet on the sector. Um, yep. And all of those trends that I was talking about before continuing into the into the future. So that's nice. kind of the nitty gritty of what you of what you're getting. And the last thing I guess I'll point out is these are I think entirely overseas based companies. So you're getting on one hand diversification, on the other hand, you're getting currency risk and exposure depending on which way it wants to go. Uh, and to some degree, the benefit of video games are global, right? It couldn't it couldn't be a better representation of of exactly that. But you are you're buying it on the ASX, but you are buying effectively US and European businesses as maybe Asian businesses as well. Yep. Yep, Beautiful. definitely. Right. You're getting so US, that's, you're that's getting Asian. Okay. Uh, yeah, so you're getting US businesses, you're getting Asian. There's some, I think there's a, a couple from Europe in there. There's also a management nice. fee, as is the case with you yeah. know, ETF products. <laughs> I think it's around 0.55%. Um, okay. you know, and, and the risks are obviously you're betting on a sector. So anything that negatively impacts that sector mm -hmm. is going to hurt the performance of this underlying ETF. And there's also and some other come companies to the risk like... in a minute. Don't, uh, don't, don't give this away yet. We're going to have to do the risk in a second. So just, just hold the horses. Okay. Uh, sorry. Let's, let's, that's all good. Let's, let's go to the bull case. So you, you kind of already told us a little bit about the size of the sector, why it's interesting, why it's exciting. Um, as you say, with people like Pizza Hut are handing over cold, hard cash for virtual naming rights. Uh, that tells you something. When you're swapping something real for something virtual, you better believe there's something real about the virtual, if I can mix the metaphor. Um, tell us, just give us the bull case. Obviously, I think we could probably imagine from what you've already said, or, or we could imagine what might happen in future, why this might be worth investing in. But just give me a sense from your perspective, a couple of the key points of, of the bull case as to why you think an investment in this video gaming and esports ETF is worth making. Okay, so video games are an incredible platform, like I said. They can actively hold people's engagement for hours on end, which is what advertisers <laughs> want, and which is why yeah, advertisers right. are, are flocking to uh, video games. It is a very yeah. popular field. I expect that to continue, if not get mm -hmm. better. There is also increasing optionality around the various companies that make up this ETF. I've talked about the live events, uh, but going back to something like Unity Software, yes, they mm -hmm. make video games, but gaming engines like Unity Software users or what Unity, Unity software sells, that mm. software is also increasingly being used in other industries such as entertainment and construction because of the ability to create and, and simulate, you know, actual real world scenarios because they have physics engines. Mm. You can build buildings in them all of the, and you can see what happens if, you know, something happens to it. So mm. there is this added optionality and this comes into the next big thing. And, uh, this is potentially a long way off, but it's something that I've been thinking about and I do think is going to happen sometime is what's called the metaverse. Or if you've read the book, Ready Player One, they called it the <laughs> Oasis, which is this completely immersive digital world that with the help of VR and things like that, people can get into. And I think these companies are going to, if that ever happens, and that will become a huge business in itself. And we've seen companies like Roblox actually call themselves a metaverse company because they are creating this platform where developers can build individual worlds for people to visit. Then these companies are going to be the ones that are dr really the driving force behind that. So that's the, so the metaverse, the really big kind of, you know, you know, small probability, but huge thing in the future, but yeah, right. Everything I'm also saying about, you know, the gaming engines, the advertising, the live events, that's happening now. And that's going mm. to, at least in my view, increasingly happen in the future. So that's why I expect the gaming industry to continue growing 
at a decent rate and why mm -hmm. we're here talking about this ETF today. I like it. So you've got uh, an industry that's already existing, but is growing and you expect to keep growing. More people spending more time on it, being monetized at greater levels. And as you rightly point out, even though there are already more people watching some esports events than, than the Super Bowl, you can imagine a scenario where the 7 billion people on earth, a decent minority of those are going to be tuning into one or many events as a as a spectator sport. I'm going to say, mate, I'm way too old to enjoy esports. If I see someone playing, I want to grab the control and have a go myself. Uh, but I'm also mindful, as you say, that one and a half plus people at, at a time uh, are watching other people play games as a spectator sport and it's really working for them. So I think that's, if you're watching this and you're like me, you think, ah, that's not possible. Of course, that wouldn't happen. Remember that uh, I, you, are not necessarily the audience. And plenty of people watching, by the way, are saying, hey, I'm there. I'm already on Twitch. I'm already watching this stuff. I'm already seeing the Pizza Hut Stadium. Uh, all that stuff, as you said, it's happening and will likely continue to happen. I, I quite like. And it's also fair to say, mate, and you kind of alluded to this, but the fact that it's an ETF means you don't have to necessarily pick the winner or, or one or two of the winners. Maybe it's Unity, maybe it's Activision Blizzard, maybe it's NVIDIA, um, maybe it's all of them. Uh, but to some degree, the, the very existence of the ETF means that if the theme is right and the opportunity writ large is right, yes, you won't make as much money as you pick the one winner by definition because averages are always lower than the, the highest number in the field. So you're not going to get the best possible return from one of those 26 businesses. You're also not going to get the worst or the third worst or the fifth worst you're probably going to get some sort of reasonable diversified exposure, as you say, single sector. So not, not diversification in the, in the traditional sense, but you don't have to pick the winner. You can find a trend you like and, and go from there. Is that fair to say? That's that's exactly it. Yeah. Nice. All right. Let's go to the risks then. So um, you've kind of alluded to that a little bit already, but what might happen to make a, an investment in this video gaming esports ETF a bit of a loser, if I can use the gaming term? Uh, what's what's going to what's going to cost you money if this goes badly? So yeah, it's an ETF that's based on a single industry. Anything that happens to that industry that reduces the growth of that industry is going to negatively impact the performance of this ETF. There's no way of getting around that. Also, because it's a lot more concentrated than your typical index ETF, like I said, the top 10 companies make up around 60% of the portfolio. You're not getting that. Usually you can completely wipe company specific risk off when you've got this really huge diversified ETF. This isn't the case here. The top 10 companies make up 60% of the portfolio. If NVIDIA is the largest and that mm -hmm. is impacted not just by the gaming market, but a few other markets. Right. It's also in cryptocurrency, autonomous vehicles, all of that type of stuff. So mm -hmm. if something happens to one of those main businesses, that's really bad. Mm. And, you know, so competition, you know, some type of really negative event, you know, let your imagination run wild. It's going to hit. <laughs> it's going, you're not going to be as protected as you would if you bought, say, you know, the Vanguard yeah. MSCI International Index, which has 1500 <laughs> yeah. companies in there and the top, yeah, and right. the top company is only like 5%. So mm. that's the biggest risk. Uh, and yeah. it all revolves around the gaming industry for some reason, stop growing or fizzling out and you know, perhaps people just decide that they prefer to listen to the radio during the day rather than play video games. Old people. Uh, yeah. There's also, uh, like I said, management fee that needs to be considered because mm -hmm. it will eat some of those returns. Mm -hmm. uh, you've mentioned the foreign exchange uh, movements. That's an easy one for investors to forget, but it's real. Mm -hmm. uh, any mm -hmm. adverse movements in foreign exchange is going to hit the performance as well. But mm -hmm. those are the general kind of risks relating to this ETF. Makes sense. I'm going to add one or at least propose one. You can tell me if you think you're right or not. This actually isn't a risk, but when we're talking about risks, we need to make sure investors are aware of central movements in share prices. Now, we would be the first to say, maybe the second to say, volatility and risk are not the same thing. And so just because a share price or an ETF price can be volatile does not mean it's necessarily risky or doesn't add to the risks as long as your time horizon is long enough. But I would say, mate, because... This is a pretty cool sector that lots of people are kind of excited about, but equally that sentiment can wax and wane. There may be long periods of outperformance driven on no, not much more than sentiment and potentially long periods of underperformance, underperformance driven on not much more than sentiment either. Just because people get excited about it, they get pessimistic about it backwards and forwards. So even separate from the underlying businesses themselves and the overall performance of the sector, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Again, you may have a different view, but I wouldn't be surprised to see this go through meaningful periods of great performance 
and then potentially longish, like 12 months plus periods of just when everyone's kind of given up on the thing, they've walked away, something else is more exciting and shiny and important. Um, I wouldn't be surprised in the medium term to see sentiment have a more significant impact on say, a sector like this, as it might on say Tesla or Netflix or a, a business that just people get excited and then very pessimistic about. Is that is that in your wheelhouse as well? Yeah, I mean, that's going, I think, you know, a lot of people have been talking about the attractiveness of video games as an investment and how big that world could be. That could obviously change next year when the next hot thing comes up that everyone's That's talking right. about. So yeah, yeah. You, you're going to see volatility, which is true for any, any company, um, yeah. for any investment. So yeah, expect it here as well. There you go. Mate, let's sum it all up for me. Give me my patented, well, I don't think anyone's yet done a 60 second elevator pitch in 60 seconds, but I'll, I'll, I'll continue the challenge. Eventually I'll get one, I'm sure. Uh, mate, give me the 60 second elevator pitch. If you're stuck in an elevator, I'm going from the first to the 31st floor with you. What is the quick one minute pitch on why I should buy the eSports video gaming ETF, ESPO? Okay, so the video game market's huge. It's been growing. I expect it to continue to grow as not only more and more advanced games come out in the market, but also all the other ways that it is increasingly monetized that I've spoke about, the live events, the advertising, the mm. separate uses for gaming engines, all of that type of stuff. And then there's potentially big things happen in the future. So with this ETF, you get exposure mm. to that industry and you don't have to try to pick winners. And that is my quick elevator pitch. I reckon you've pretty much nailed it. I might have to get the timer put on this one for next time. I, I might, uh, we might try and increase the, uh, uh, increase the production values. We'll see, we'll see how we go. I'll, I'll ask Damien, our, our resident <laughs> guru, if we can do that next time. You've got away with this time, mate. It won't be this time. I, I won't do it to you after the fact, but uh, maybe from next week, we'll see how we go. Andrew, thank you for bringing us the Video Gaming and Esports ETF. It's the Vanek Vector Video Gaming and Esports ETF. How did I go? Is that roughly right? That's, that's the one. You got it. All right, ESPO on the ASX. Fools, if you've enjoyed this, remember this is both a podcast episode and a YouTube video. Yep, we're multitasking. If you're listening to it on the podcast, firstly, thank you for subscribing to Motley Fool Money. But also don't forget, you can get this and more. Whether you want to see me as an open question, you can see Andrew and his conviction on the YouTube channel. Just simply go to YouTube and look up the Motley Fool Australia. You can see all of our videos there. We're doing heaps. We're putting a heap up at the moment, uh, maybe eight or 10 videos a week. We're kind of averaging right now, which is awesome. So if you're not there, you're missing out. Make sure you like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. If you're watching this on YouTube, firstly, thank you. If you want some music for your ears, there are some podcast episodes like this, but also some others on our podcast, Motley Fool Money. Jump on your favorite podcast machine and look that up. You can get all the great podcast stuff that we have to bring you. A couple of episodes a week, plus this one, we do a, a general news of the week a podcast episode, myself and Andrew Page, and we do our most popular mailbag episode on a Sunday afternoon where you get your questions answered. So make sure you do check that out. Um, we're across all the socials as well. Let me do a really quick run through of those. Andrew, you're on Twitter at Andrew Leggett. That's right, isn't it? That's the one. Beautiful. Are you on Instagram yet with a with a uh, uh, professional profile or is that uh, beyond the bailiwick thus far? I, I am on Instagram, but there's nothing there. <laughs> there so, you go. So, so Twitter uh, is the place I, you want to find. Feel free to Andrew. follow me. Feel free to follow me, but I don't know what my <laughs> nice. name is on there. I can't remember and you're not going <laughs> to see much. If you can much. find him. It's like the A-team. If, if, if you need help and if you can find him, follow Andrew Leggett on Instagram. In the meantime, if you are on Twitter or Insta, you can follow me at TMFScottP. You can follow The Motley Fool on Twitter and Insta at The Motley Fool AU. You can follow us on Facebook, The Motley Fool Australia. So facebook.com forward slash The Motley Fool Australia or facebook.com forward slash Scott Phillips Money. We're on all the platforms. We're not yet on TikTok. Andrew's been pushing me for that one. We may at some point, but no one wants to hear my singing or see my dancing. So that's, a, that's an issue for TikTok, but we'll see how we go on that one. In the meantime, jump on the other socials, follow us there. And again, make sure you do subscribe to the podcast and like and subscribe and hit the notification bell on our YouTube channel. Until next time and next week's Stock of the Week, full on.